Hello everyone, I am Apoorv and this is Shashank and we appreciate you taking the time to be here. Today we are going to talk about our implementation of multi-tenancy in Kubernetes at Uber. This is a brief agenda for the talk. First we will introduce the compute platform at Uber. Then we discuss what multi-tenancy means at Uber. Then we discuss a simple solution and present the challenges we faced with it. And then we introduce a multi-tenant single cluster solution, discuss its design, and finally talk about the challenges we faced while implementing it. First, let me introduce a compute platform at Uber. Uber operates its own private data centers, but it's in the process of deprecating them away in favor of OCI and GCP. On top of the physical machines and VMs, we have a layer which we refer to as Crane, which essentially implements host as a service and is responsible for providing an abstraction to hide away all the underlying providers from the platforms. On top of Crane, we have a container orchestration platform layer, which is based on Kubernetes. It is our own distribution of Kubernetes forked from open source with the, uh, the basic components being exactly the same as open source. On top of Kubernetes, we have user-facing uh, platforms. For example, we have UP, which is what developers use to manage all their stateless microservices. We have Michelangelo, which uses Ray to manage machine learning workloads, data sciences workbench to run jobs, Spark, and so on. Here is a brief summary of the scale of the Kubernetes installation at Uber. It manages more than four and a half million cores with more than 4,000 microservices being deployed more than 100,000 times every day. And across stateless and batch, we have more than a million and a half containers being launched every day on the platform. Next, let me introduce what multi-tenancy means for Uber. Note that Uber is a consumer company and not a SaaS enterprise company. So we have no requirement or no concerns around having to run untrusted third-party software in our clusters. So the definition of multi-tenancy will be slightly different from what we traditionally see in a SaaS company. So Uber's definition of multi-tenancy can be captured as the following three requirements. The first requirement is data plane isolation, which essentially states that Workloads belonging to different tenants cannot be co-located on the same machine. Of course, workloads belonging to the same machine uh, to the same tenant can run on the same host, but they cannot be co-located with workloads of other tenants. If we define node pool as an abstraction to capture a group of hosts managed together, similar to ASG or VMSS or MIG, then this requirement essentially says that each tenant gets its own node pool. The second requirement is access isolation. A tenant can, of course, read and manage its own resources in ETCD. However, it should not be able to access any resource information like nodes, pods, Spark application, Ray cluster, nodes, et cetera, of any other tenant. The third and final requirement is control plane isolation, which in some sense is a more generic implementation of the previous requirement, and it states that a tenant running on a Kubernetes cluster should not be impacted in any way by other tenants which may be running in the same cluster. For example, a tenant, a tenant running workloads with a high scheduling throughput should not impact the scheduling latency of another tenant running low scheduling throughput workloads with a low scheduling latency requirement. Now, there's a very simple way to solve this problem. Let's give each tenant its own Kubernetes cluster and its own dedicated node pool and attach the node pool to the cluster, and we are done. Uh, we get data plane isolation because each tenant has its own node pool. We get control plane and access isolation because each tenant has its own cluster. This is a fairly simple solution, and when we started off, this is what we did. Now to understand why we ran into problems with this solution, let's take a step back and understand what use cases can potentially be solved with such a solution. Of course, when we started off, we had certain workloads with certain security concerns, 
which required us to solve all the three requirements stated above. But once we solved these three requirements, over time we figured that we could solve more and more use cases um, with the same solution. And as those use cases came up, for ease, we just use this. We just kept applying the same solution to them. Uh, for example, let's say there is a workload which acts as a noisy neighbor to others in either the data plane or the control plane, or in both. Since this solution provides us both data plane and control plane isolation, we could apply the same solution for them. Uh, similarly, if you have a workload which is very susceptible to noisy neighbors because of low latency requirements, we could isolate them through the same solution as well. Any workload which requires its own dedicated hardware, like GPUs, again, like we use the same solution to isolate them away onto the hardware they want to run on. Thus, over time, the number of use cases which we could solve using the same solution kept on growing. And as the number of use cases grow, grew, using a solution of building a different cluster for each tenant or each use case started running into multiple challenges. And here's a quick run through of those challenges. The first one was manageability. So the way we modeled each use case was that each cluster had its own cluster type. Or rather, each use case had its own cluster type. And each cluster type had its own configuration. Thus, there was a configuration bloat where every use case or every tenant has its own RBAC end date limit configuration, its own network and service discovery configuration, its own observability configuration, its own uh, host maintenance and um, node upgrade configuration, and so on. As you can guess, this was fairly error prone and misconfigurations and completely misconfigurations was fairly common. Another issue was feature mismatch, where any feature which required us to roll out a new operator, new CRD, new controller, new configuration, it started off with rolling out to the use cases which had an immediate demand for it. And due to rollout fatigue, it would stop and never get rolled out to all cluster types. This also led to a lot of operational concerns, especially during incident mitigation, because whenever an incident happened, the first the on-call had to figure out, OK, like what feature is enabled in this cluster? What configuration does this cluster have before they could take any steps to mitigate? The third, and in our opinion, the biggest issue was user experience. For the tenants themselves, the overhead, the operational overhead to manage and grow their clusters was fairly high where most tenant operations required a multi-step runbook. Uh, let me give an example. Let's say a tenant wanted to grow into a new availability zone. Um, for context, at Uber, each Kubernetes cluster is scoped to one AZ for blast radius reasons. So let's say in a particular region, we have three AZs, and Uber infrastructure has set up three AZs. A tenant is running in two of them and now wants to grow in the third one because there's a glut of capacity in third AZ and it wants to access it. Now what they would have to do is to reach out to multiple teams, manually get their cluster set up, their node pool set up, all the resources they require set up before they could actually get access to that capacity. Another issue was uh, efficiency. Of course, we have the control plane overhead for every cluster. But more than that, another issue was the free pool buffer. So let me first define what that means. To minimize scheduling latency during scale-up operations, we always maintain some hosts in a free pool buffer. And during scale-up, what we did is to merely move the host from the free pool buffer into the appropriate node pool, whoever needed it. Now, due to the time it took to transfer machines between clusters, we had to maintain a free pool buffer per tenant for each cluster rather than being able to maintain a much smaller shared free pool buffer. So due to these reasons, we looked for a different solution which could help reduce, if not completely eliminate, all these challenges. And the solution we settled upon was a multi-tenant single cluster architecture. In this solution, we have one big giant Kubernetes cluster. And within that cluster, all tenants reside. They get their own namespace, and they get their own dedicated node pool. And there's a one-to-one -one mapping between namespaces and node pools. So when a node or a machine joins a node pool, the kubelet registers itself with the API server. And when it does so, 
it adds a label to the note object to identify which tenant does that node belong to. Now from a user point of view, whenever they submit a workload, they just they have to submit it to their namespace. And when they do that, the system automatically adds a node selector to ensure that the workload gets launched in on a node belonging to the tenant's node pool. Now, when we create a new AZ, we always create this cluster because this cluster is also running the services to bootstrap the rest of the infrastructure, so this cluster always exists. So when this cluster exists, we are gonna create all the namespaces and node pools upfront because if the cluster already exists, there is zero cost to actually create these node spaces, namespaces and node pools if they have zero capacity. So we only pay when we add capacity to the node pool. So what we do is that we create the cluster, we create all the namespaces and node pools so that they are always available for use except that they have zero capacity. Now let's go back to the previous example of what happens when a tenant wants to grow into a new AZ, right? So what they would do is that they would just go and submit their workloads into their namespace in the new AZ. The system would add a node selector which would force them to land on their own node pool, but that node pool has zero capacity, so the pods will be pending. The cluster autoscaler will kick in. It will see that pods are pending. It will transfer machines from the free pool buffer into the tenant's node pool, and that's it. The pods get placed and start running. So from a user point of view, after the initial onboarding of a tenant is complete, in all scenarios, we have replaced that multi-step manual run books which they used to have with the simple stop step of just submit your workloads to your namespace and that's it. So everything else is taken care of by the infrastructure underneath. So this was a very high level and hopefully intuitive overview of the solution. Now I'm going to hand off to Shashank to talk about the intricacies of the design and also discuss some of the challenges we face while implementing and rolling out the solution. Thank you. Let me start with how we achieve access isolation. We use native support provided by Kubernetes in the form of RBACs using roles and role bindings to restrict access to tenant-specific resources only. Obviously, now with a single cluster, manageability and operational challenges mentioned prior are no longer an issue. However, the complexity now lies in solving the control plane isolation. We achieved this through a mix of native isolation support provided by Kubernetes along with extended support for some. API priority and fairness. We configured tenant and user specific API rate limits using flow schemas so that we can assign requests and control the fair resource sharing. And then we used priority settings for tenant where we configured concurrency shares and queues to ensure that each tenant only consumes a certain amount of the control plane resources. We also refine them over time by monitoring their behavior. Network policies. We assigned each tenant a separate namespace and leverage the use of network policies to generally prevent cross namespace communication, thereby effectively isolating tenants at the network layer. We also provide support for configurable network policies to enable cross namespace communication as and when needed. Scheduling. We leverage the default scheduler with extended support for node specific labels. However, we do have a problem where Scheduling queues are not namespace isolated. We are trying to tackle this problem and we are open to ideas. Now, let me talk about how we match capacity requirements of tenants. We have two different components that together ensure the appropriate placement of workloads. The federation layer. This is the tenant-facing interface that the users interact with. This has a global view of capacity allocated and or available for each tenant across all the ACs. The resource controller. This generates the zonal capacity overview 
of each tenant. It's a custom controller which calculates the total available and used capacity for each tenant namespace. We leverage native resource quota object and associated a one-to-one -one mapping for each tenant namespace. To provide a complete view, the federation layer asynchronously queries the zonal Kubernetes clusters to fetch the available capacity from the resource quota of each namespace. And then when placing a workload, it picks the least loaded zone in terms of CPU and memory allocation for that specific tenant. This sums up how we achieve control plane isolation. Now let's move on to data plane isolation. We primarily rely on node pools to achieve hard isolation of sharing resources across tenant workloads at the node level. Each tenant is associated with a dedicated node pool. These node pools are one-to-one -one mapped to the corresponding tenant namespaces. Every node in the cluster is mapped to a node pool. How is this achieved? The kubelet running on every node registers the node with a new node label specifying the tenant namespace as value of the label when registering with the API server. There are multiple ways on how each kubelet node identifies the namespace to which it belongs. One option is via config provided as environmental variable during the host provisioning process. The other option is to call a metadata service that provides the needed info. We chose the environmental variable option to reduce the number of online dependencies. Over the next few slides, I will cover some of the custom components that help us in achieving full data plane isolation. Because of data plane isolation, we now have multiple node pools that we need to manage per cluster rather than having one node pool per cluster as seen in the prior multi-cluster architecture. This added more complexity into managing day-to-day -day operations like maintenance activities related to upgrades, bad host remediation, etc. Now, one of the workflow I will cover here is node maintenance. This is basically ensuring safe replacement of nodes to handle operations like kernel upgrades, kubelet upgrades, or bad host remediation, et cetera, so as to ensure the fleet of nodes are secure, stable, and performant all the time. Traditionally, we used to allocate a percentage of the cluster to undergo maintenance at any point of time. We call this internally as drain limit. This was a cluster-specific setting. But now, we support tenant-specific drain limits. This is to ensure every tenant is isolated and we did not take beyond a configured percentage of capacity away from the tenant. We introduced an admission controller plugin that validates every node maintenance request received by the API server. This effectively verifies that the total number of nodes in maintenance for the tenant remains below the configured drain limit threshold. Again, we use node labels to filter the nodes per tenant along with taints for detecting the nodes in maintenance. Oftentimes, when the allocation percentage of a cluster drops, we used to reclaim certain capacity to increase our allocation efficiency. There are several attributes like allocation percentage, max pod topology, spread, failure domain, etc., that holistically determine the number of nodes that are safe to be returned. This workflow is also modified to be tenant aware. This ensured a similar validation check on returning nodes as what we have seen prior. 
Now the last component in the data plane isolation is the capacity autoscaler. This is a global component that dynamically manages capacity across tenants and clusters in all the zones. This is similar to the native Kubernetes cluster autoscaler, but with more complex logic. So it validates demand versus supply and dynamically adjusts capacity according to the needs where it pulls in capacity when there are unscheduled parts and returns nodes when the allocation percentage drops below a certain percentage. It internally maintains a small hot standby buffer pool of nodes to reduce the scheduling latency instead of provisioning everything on demand. The inter-node pool capacity swaps are now trivial with merely node label swapping compared to the traditional re-imaging workflow for cluster swaps. As you can see in this diagram, since we maintain all the node pools and namespaces config identical by pre-creating them in all the zones, the whole capacity scaling workflow is seamless and fast enough across the zones. Let me quickly recap how the user experience workflow would look like on a standard deploy. When the user initiates the application deploy, the federation layer identifies the tenant namespace to which the application belongs. It then creates a pod spec object with the tenant namespace as the label in the, no in the node selector field, and then hands it over to the zonal control plane. The zonal control plane filters all the nodes matching the specified namespace node label, scores the node, and then picks the right top node and, and assigns it. Now, let me give an update on the current production status of this single cluster architecture. Currently, we have 100% migrated nearly 10 to 15 tenants to this new architecture. We have reduced the overall clusters by 30% globally. And we plan to complete the 100% migration by end of 2025. Now, let me cover the aspects that worked well for us and those that remain challenging. Operational ease. We have less number of clusters now to turn up. There aren't any custom binaries or configs for control plane components that we need to maintain. Scheduling. We haven't seen any impact on scheduling latency, even with tens of namespaces. Our pod binding rate is still identical with our multi-cluster architecture. The capacity management. With configs now being identical across zones, adding and removing capacity has been seamless without the overhead of creating a cluster. Efficiency-wise. With a single control plane across tenants, we reduce the control plane cost by tens of hosts per cluster, effectively three to four x per zone. We have a single standby buffer pool of hosts without the need for dedicated pool per tenant as per the prior architecture. API priority and fairness, we, with that we have a good control over resource contention preventing cross-tenant impact. Now let's talk about the interesting challenges. Firstly, there is no native support for a node object to be namespaced. We ended up managing the node lifecycle with custom controllers. So as to ensure the correctness of the bindings, we built monitoring around detection of these wrong bindings. And then we needed to aggregate resource quotas per node pools. We even managed node remediation workflows with custom drain configurations per tenant as mentioned in the previous slides. Let me cover the remaining challenges in the upcoming slides. Scheduler isolation. Well, there is no native support for scheduler isolation. A bad tenant could merely impact or starve the scheduling latency of other tenant workloads. There are no per tenant scheduling queues. 
Since nodes aren't namespaced, there isn't an easy way to filter nodes. Some of the options that we are exploring include active-active scheduler. Basically, the idea here is we wanted to shard scheduler instances by tenant and have the corresponding instance actively schedule the designated tenants. The idea is to ensure critical tenants get a dedicated scheduler instance. Another option includes enforcing per tenant scheduling queues and have scheduler adhere to tenant-based priority similar to APF model. Of course, any suggestions are welcome. Now, the last challenge we have is the bootstrap clusters. These are responsible for bringing up the low-level infrastructure components that are necessary for the regular clusters to operate. The overhead in managing these bootstrap clusters is quite significant on top of the regular clusters as the number of zones are increasing. These components, namely the infra services, can be primarily categorized as native core compute components like API server, scheduler, and control manager. And other components include custom controllers, observability stack components, software networking components, etc. The idea that we have implemented is to introduce a new tenant, namely a bootstrap tenant, in the regular clusters that is responsible for bringing up majority of the infra components, excluding the core compute components. And then we plan to have a bootstrap light layer to bring up the core components. This will not completely eliminate the need for an other cluster, but at least reduces a significant overhead that we observed at Uber. Lastly, I would like to thank all the members of various teams at Uber who helped in this journey. Thank you. Uh, thanks, guys. That was an excellent talk. I think you guys have a very clever solution to uh, multi-tenancy. I certainly haven't seen that model before. Uh, it looks like because your, uh, your tenants are able to work entirely within a namespace, I'm assuming they're not needing to deploy CRDs or cluster roles or they're not deploying Helm charts that include those things. Have you bumped into challenges with your customers where they've asked for those sorts of things and how do you handle those situations? That's a great question. So um, if a tenant wants a CRD, I mean, we own and operate the CRD, not the tenant. Um, and the CRD is available to all tenants but the custom resources they create will be namespace scoped and will be available only within that namespace for that tenant. But the CRD is not namespace scoped. Great, thank you. And maybe my turn, good talk, thank you. Uh, can you speak to the scalability? How many namespaces do you think this will scale to? Uh, if I understand correctly, you're asking about the number of namespaces that this model can scale to? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, currently we have around like uh, hundreds of namespaces that we are trying to target. And our initial results does not, I mean, seem like anything out of the box. It seems to be scalable. Um, but we haven't tested beyond 100. So I'm assuming you mean scalability in terms of API server and scheduler scalability. And we benchmarked and we didn't see, as Shashank said, we didn't see any impact. Okay, and then the second question, when you say node pool, are you talking about the carpenter definition of node pool or something else? That's a good question. Yeah, we are currently not using any cloud provider for our Kubernetes cluster tunnel, but the node pool is something that you can correlate with what you see with the cloud providers. So we have an internal group of nodes, that is what we call at Uber as host group, that is what we call here as node pool. It's a it's a one-to-one -one what you can think about what a node pool is. So please keep in mind that we uh, have on-prem data centers, so we can't really, you know, <laughs> Like we have to like fall back to the lowest common denominator, which is uh, on-prem. Yeah. So we can't really use um, any of such cloud abstractions like node pools. So we defined our own node pool, which as Shashank says, is host group. And that's what we use even in the cloud itself. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, uh, my question was on kind of the tenant model um, with the one-to-one -one mapping. Um, if a tenant wanted to like write a platform that maybe other teams or developers use, would they have to implement their own 
isolation mechanism, or is this just not like a supported model? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, as uh, so I think in one of the slides, which is Shang, so, there's, so for every tenant, there is a federation layer which they come through. And the user isolation happens at the, at the federation layer and not at the cluster layer. So cluster layer, you get, a, get your own um, namespace. Uh, multiple tenants like uh, up for stateless microservices, they implement the isolation at the user level in up itself. And some of them actually use namespaces to divide within themselves, but uh, that's outside the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I had a follow-up on the same question. So how large is the tenant in your definition? Because wouldn't having many tenants lead to effectively poor resource utilization on the nodes? So, um, so we have different kinds of tenants. Um, some tenants are pretty large, right? Uh, for example, all stateless microservices kind of constitute one tenant, and that's pretty big. The smaller tenants, um, I think like you're thinking in terms of fragmentation, that because of fragmentation, uh, the resource utilization can potentially go down. And yes, that is correct. Uh, it can potentially go down. But most of our tenants which suffer from fragmentation are large enough. The tenants which are small tend to either use the complete machine for themselves, or we kind of customize the hardware which we give them um, to make sure that they get good utilization slash like don't suffer from fragmentation. And just to follow up, like the one thing, if you have a tenant for all microservices, how do you, like you didn't, you didn't talk about like pod preemption and things like that. So how do you worry about like noisy neighbor if all microservices are in the same tenant and they're yeah, sharing? That, that's, that's, that's correct, right? So basically there are a set of services which act as both noisy neighbors as well as are susceptible to noisy neighbors. They get their own tenants. So, uh, so they are there in their own tenant space. And again, like the way we work across is that we know like how much is the vertical size they need, and we kind of get a VM which kind of matches um, you know their requirements. So that's how we optimize for fragmentation for them. Um, the number is not very large, but like there are a few which belongs to that category. Thank you. My question is: Do you do right sizing within the zone? Like when a new, when you bring up a new zone, the zone is obviously empty. Do you like Do you try to right size its CD instance count or API server instance count, or do you just let them be the same? And so we we don't try to right size etcd or API server um, because like it's just five machines. So yeah. we just schedule them to accommodate for the largest zone. Most of our zones. Um, again, because of blast radius reasons, are kind of equally sized between 10 to 20 percent of a region. Um, even though we may not get by that capacity up front, um, they increase in size um, to uh, you know account. And we have fairly like we have fairly sophisticated a uh, lot of engineers who basically do capacity projections based on the trip growth. And uh, we kind of ac account for the capacity increase up front and like build the zones and et cetera. Like, quite in advance. And so we don't try to right size the control plane according to zone. Thank you. Hey, I was wondering, like, uh, how did you guys do a network isolation between the tenants? Yeah, so that is something that we are actively uh, looking into. We are using CNI-based uh, IP per pod. But our current model is we have our, our own implementation of the uh, discovery of the network routes. So that is something that's coming in uh, 2025. Yeah, to be like to add to it, like so we have our own service discovery layer, which is different from uh, IP per host model. So uh, every basically it's a host IP, and then we have um, uh, we have a system which basically does the uh, service discovery, which implements service discovery. Um, the that particular component is also namespace aware and has uh, allows for policies to kind of do isolation. Okay, and uh, I have one more question. So for the node isolation, you mentioned about custom controllers, right? I was wondering, like, is it any open source ones or like a customly written for Uber? Yeah, currently they are not open sourced. Uh, they are within Uber at the moment. Uh, in 2025, we can consider doing it because we are doing some, some kind of enhancements on top of it. But yes, we will eventually try to open source them. If you have a specific use case in mind, please like let's talk after to see uh, you know what because I don't think like if you need the entire system as open source or there are specific components you need so we can discuss offline. Sure. 
So I have two parts to the question. The first is how many tenants are you managing here? So just in a raw number. And do you have tenants outside the Uber, you know, kind of world, or are there only inside the Uber world? So tenants only inside the Uber workload, like so there is no external software. Like so we don't have to worry about running external third party software in our clusters. Um, number of tenants? Yeah, right now uh, we have around uh, in the order of like 50 to 100 tenants that we have, all the way from products to um, you know infra level stuff. Again, these tenants are different from the, the SaaS kind of tenants that we sure. were trying to mention. Um, so right now, uh, we, we have migrated like 10 to 20 that I've mentioned in the previous, like currently into this new architecture. And we have benchmarked for nearly like hundreds of tenants and we don't see any uh, impact. And, and are the tenants broken out by business, you know, you mentioned products, so I can envision, you know, billing, booking, you know, that sort of thing. Is that kind of how the tenants are broken up? No, not necessarily. So it depends on use case to use case. There are some tenants which have actually security concerns and they need to be isolated because of them. Uh, so that number is fairly small, like two tenants belong to that category. Um, most of the use cases are around things like noisy neighbors, wanting special hardware, um, Latency sense to Latency sense um, too. things like that. So they get categorized into their own tenants, and it's a mixture of, um, uh, and also like, uh, so for example, machine workload, machine learning workloads are their own tenant. Jobs is their own tenant. Got it. Um, unless they want, like, some of them can be co-located um, with, for example, the stateless services to kind of make use of the idle capacity in stateless. So some of the machine learning workloads actually run in the stateless namespace, but like uh, most of them run as their own tenant. Thank you. Uh, we can we can take more questions offline. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.